Welcome to Goldfish on Games, where it's finally time to reveal the Pong Clone Army. Pong was such a groundbreaking game that for a while it could be claimed that it was the games industry. And when the AY3 5800, the Pong on the chip, was invented, the Pong machines just flooded the market. And thus, the Pong clone was born. And these came out in quite the range of form factors and controllers. Amazingly, Pong machines are still being made today. Here are two that I have, a build your own Pong clone and this mini arcade machine. So let's see how things have changed over the past 40 years as we compare old with new. And where else can we start but with the packaging? One clear message comes across with most of them. The hardware is more important than the games. They all tend to talk about the game somewhere, but the bulk of the box is on the bit of kit inside. Which isn't completely unexpected, as everyone knew the game and its variations, as those tended to be the same across all of them. What was unique was the hardware that you played them on. The modern ones are a bit similar, with the arcade box mostly just being this cutout to show the mini arcade itself, and the build it yourself is mostly all about the parts that you get and an idea of what it will look like when it's finished. I do have to make special mention of this box, which was styled after a briefcase with this very minimalistic look. I'm not sure if there would have been a slipcase for it, as I've found no other images, but I like to think that this was all that was on it, and it was all that was required. So after talking about the hardware, let's check some out in more detail. It really does feel like there's almost endless variations, but you'll pretty much always find the following. Some way of selecting the various games. This could be a series of switches, a dial, a slider, or just some press buttons, as these clones always had more than one game. There are also this class of machine that doesn't have any labels for the buttons, and the reason for this is that they'll actually take a cartridge, and the game they will select will be different depending on what cart is inserted. Now don't be fooled into thinking these are actual consoles, as all they've done is move that Pong on a chip into the cart itself, and inside the main box, well, it's really just a few switches, the timing clock, player input, and an RF modulator. Everything that made the games actually work were on the cart, and by this point they were using the AY386 series, with the most popular being the 8610, which was an updated variant on the previous chip. And you'll actually see that number, 610, shown on the carts or even on the hardware in some way. Now there are at least 5 other 86 class chips that were made, and they all had different games, which formed the core set of carts that you'd find for most of these machines. The modern machines are quite different. The Build It Yourself is the truest Pong machine I have, as it only has a single game that you can play on it. And before we see the mini arcade, we really need to talk about how we power these devices. Now it seems batteries were common between old and new, and it's pretty much the only way to power the Hanes, and this is even an option on the mini arcade. But like the Pong machines of old, we can also power it from the mains. The older machines had a couple of variations, but most of the time it was this 3.5mm headphone style jack that was used. It's weird to think that these machines were mostly being powered by batteries when they still needed a TV to be useful. I can only assume there was a lack of power sockets back then, or it was just a nice way of earning a bit of extra money by selling the power pack separately. Though it could be argued that many of these machines had to be brought closer to the user because the cables weren't very long or the controllers were built into the unit itself. So that would be one reason why it needed to be relatively portable. Thankfully you can just power up the mini arcade using USB, and it shows this nice enough menu that lets you know it's mostly full of 2600 games. Before we get onto the games, which amazingly is most likely the least interesting part of all of this, let's take a better look at the range of input methods that they provided. Paddle controllers were quite popular, as we can see them both on the modern clones as well as the older machines. Now, some of them have this classic style with a big knob that you can turn, but others have this thumb wheel style as well. Now, typically, they'll all be potentiometers, and so they'll have a set range that they can move in. 
apart from this modern one that actually clicks as you move around and is completely free to move as much as you want. Now some of the machines had sliders which are quite cool as it's a direct one to one mapping to where the paddles will show on the screen. But when we started to get to some of the later games that required not just vertical movement but horizontal we started to see joystick controllers. These were all by and large analog as that's what the chip expected to get in. And as such they could actually drift slightly so you'd find these wheels that could help calibrate the input so they would be centered when you weren't touching it. You also got buttons on some of the controllers. Not all of them required it as you could set the hardware to auto serve the ball. Which makes this a good time to check out the games. Now combined with the fact that these devices were RF only and that they're quite old and they weren't always built to the highest specifications, the picture quality is not amazing. So I'm going to be showing off the best of the bunch, which is actually the Ingersoll Battle Commander, which uses an 8610 chip on a cart to provide the games. Now there were 10 games in total and most were two player. And we start with Squash, which a ball bounces around the walls and then each player has to try and hit it back. And if it reaches the right hand side of the screen, well it's a point. As we'll see, most of the games tend to be based around a number of bats or paddles and a ball, with a few of the games adding in some walls as well. These were not designed to be the best graphics ever, but they were reasonable for the time. The next game is Hockey, in which the players have to control both the goalie and an attacker, and they have to get the puck into the goal of the other player. The goalie is limited in their movement as they can only go up or down, but the attacker can move around freely. The sound is the standard set of beeps and boops that you've been hearing, though some of the fancier machines will actually pass the audio onto the TV, but most just had a speaker in the machine and then gave you a toggle to be able to turn it on and off. Game 3 is a twist on the classic as it's tennis and this is the closest we actually get to Pong on this cart. And the rest is just the same, you just bounce the ball off the bat as well as the walls. You can use the extra switches on the hardware to make some changes, such as changing the speed and making it much faster or slower, or giving someone a handicap, and this will happen by changing the size of their bat. The next two games were designed to be used with a light gun, I don't have a gun for this specific machine, but I do have one for the Binatone, so let's switch over to that instead. Now there's two modes, Target and Shoot, and if they sound similar, it's because they are. Target has the dot bouncing around the screen, so you have to try and target and shoot it. Shoot, on the other hand, just has a dot that will take a path across the screen from one side to the other. And again, the goal is just to shoot it. Both are obviously very basic games, but it seems surprisingly accurate. Well, compared to some of the machines I've tested anyway. The next of the 610 games is Basketball. But stop me if you've heard this already, but it's a two player game that you have to bounce the ball off the paddles as well as the various walls to try and get it in the goal. And get it right, and you get a point, which is pretty much as you'd expect. I have to say I do like the effort they put into making those baskets, but it is really difficult to get it in there. Game 7 is soccer, and I think you can guess what you need to do in this game. So instead, let's talk about the colour, as these machines were sold in two versions, black and white and colour. The chip itself just provides video information for the various parts of the screen. This would then be combined with some basic circuitry to produce a black and white picture, or it can be passed on to one of the ATX 15 chips that take in all those parts and then applies colour to them and returns a composite picture. Now it is actually possible to add colour to the black and white picture without using the extra chip. You just need to have much more circuitry on the board. Game 8 is the last of the two player games and it's Grid Ball, in which I think you need to move your grids around to try and get the ball from one side of the screen to the other. It's easily the hardest game in the collection, as the collision detection seems to be a little off. I've also had it start up quite a few times where one side has no gaps at all. So there are a few issues with this game. 
game 9 and 10 are both single player, or what it calls practice modes. And we have one for basketball, and the other is just called generic practice. The earlier machines had a subset of these games, that there were some changes as they only supported going up or down. When it comes to the modern clones, things are a little different. The building yourself has just got the single game of Pong on it. Your paddles, the ball, everything is shown up using LEDs. And as you can see, as we move the paddles, they move up and down the screen. The score is shown by just flashing some LEDs, and there's even some sound. Amazingly, there is actually a programmable microcontroller running all of this, and it's way more advanced than it really needs to be for a Pong clone but the manual does mention that you can actually reprogram it. And as you might expect, the mini console is completely different again. The built-in Pong game was actually programmed specifically for this machine, and it plays decently enough with some nice sound effects as well. Now you might be able to tell there's far more power than you might first expect, as it also emulates an Atari 2600, and has a selection of games that would work with the paddle controller, including another version of Pong, Breakout, and the always classic Circus, and can only be played on the built-in LCD display. Now I just want to point out the manual for the Ingersoll, which goes over setting it up as you would expect, but what you might not expect is the back page, where there's a circuit diagram of what's inside the machine. This was in an age where they expected you to fix your hardware if you broke it. What might surprise some people is that these things continue to be made and sold after the Atari 2600 was released, with these cart based ones being part of that fight as they were much cheaper to make and sell than a console that actually had CPU and ROM based carts. Though as the games continue to get more complex and the graphics continue to look better, and on top of all that prices started to fall, these things were destined to come to an end. This collection pretty much grew by accident, as every time I spotted a new machine it was a unique variation and I just had to pick it up because it looked so cool, and if you had one of these back in the day I'd love to hear about it. And until next time, I was the Goldfish, that was my clone army, and this was Goldfish on Games. Thank you for watching my video, I do hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, you can let me know down in the comments, or you can use those buttons just below, you know the ones I mean. Or if you're not sure yet, then you can check out two other videos that I've done that are on the screen right now. So thank you again, and I hope to see you soon.